Welcome to Teaching the Truth with Pastor Eric C. Bogan. Clearly define what I am to do. Let every word penetrate the heart. Let what is said lead them running to your arms. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. I'm not going to take much time because I'm trying to eat in Jesus' name. <laughs> I ain't playing with y'all today. I ain't playing. I ain't playing. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1. I'm only serious in Jesus' name. Genesis chapter 1. I want to talk to you today about made in his image. Made in his image. Now, the bulk of this message is really to men, but not only to men. And I'm going to just give you uh, this uh, disclaimer. It's going to take me a minute to lay some foundation here. But just stay with me. How many promises stay with me as I lay the foundation? Because I'm going to get going. And you're like, OK, where, where is it going? Just stay with me. Stay in the car. Just don't get out. Amen. We're going to lay the foundation and then we're going to, I'm going to give you my point. Amen. Genesis chapter one. Have you found it? If you can't find Genesis, just quit. Just quit. I mean, you lose. You can't find Genesis. Yeah. Just come up here now in Jesus name. Just come up. here. Genesis chapter one, verse 26. And God said, it's the Lord. He said it. Let us make man, somebody say man. man, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing, even them cockroaches that creepeth on the earth. Let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our image what God said. The word image here, the word image is translated from a Hebrew word, selim, and it means something resembling an object, something resembling an object or something else, another object in some way. Maybe not in an exact way, but in some way. It resembles it in some way. You got an, an, a thing that resembles another thing in some way. An example of that would be a copy. A copy is an image, a copy, or even a shadow, even a shadow. Like you don't, you don't even have to have all the details if you just got the outline. <laughs> If we could just get the out, get you. I mean, if we could just get some of these men in the outline of God. Image. Something that resembles another. A copy. A shadow. According to this passage, man was made in the image of God. Now, when the Bible says that man was made in the image of God, it doesn't just mean Adam was made in the image of God. That was the first man, right? When God says, let us make man in our image, he didn't just mean let us make Adam in our image. He also meant let us make Eve, the woman, the man and the woman. I can prove that. Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he, him, notice, male and female, created he what? When God says man, he didn't mean Adam, he meant mankind. 
let us make mankind in our image. And by mankind, he means male and female. Now, I want us to understand what he didn't say. He didn't say, let us make them in our image. It wasn't like he says, okay, let's make two people in our image. No. He says, let us make male and female in our image. Hmm. It's not just maleness. It's femaleness that resembles the image of God. It's not just femaleness and not just maleness. It's both male and female. It's not just people in general. It's specifically them as male and female. In other words, the different ways in which our humanity is expressed through maleness and femaleness is a picture of God. Man can be expressed in two distinct ways. Maleness, femaleness. There is no other option. I just wanted to make sure we understood that. It's important that you stay with me. Mankind comes in two categories. Maleness, femaleness. That fact that you can understand man in two distinct forms, that fact is a picture of God. John chapter 1. We might say it this way, for some of you who haven't got it yet. God made man male and female, or he made man as represented in two forms because he's represented in two forms. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting somewhere. God is represented in two forms. I want man to be a picture of me. Since I'm in two forms, let's put them in two forms. God's in two forms. It's what the Bible says. John chapter one. Verse one. In the beginning. Was the word. The word was with say with. Yes. With means two things. You can't be with yourself. If you're with yourself, they're going to put you in a hospital. You can only be with something or someone else. The word was with God and the word was God. So God was with God. That's what the Bible says. Say two forms. What the Bible says. God was two forms. First John chapter one. Let's see it again. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, just stay with me because I'm about to turn a corner here. First John chapter one. First John chapter one and verse three. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. That you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. He says our fellowship is with God, with the father and with the son. Here he tells us, because we didn't really get the clear picture in John, 
John 1 says there's God in two forms, but it just seems like they're duplicates. Ah. Here it says that God, who we saw was in two forms in John 1, is now distinct forms. Father, Son. How I many know oh, those are distinct forms? Father, Son. He says, this is God. That this relationship between the gods that we read in first and John 1 is a relationship between a father and his son. Somebody say, so there's diversity. That's why God didn't just make two human beings. He made two distinct. They were different. How many know men are different than women? You don't have to go to school to know that. Somebody say, don't play. Don't play. <laughs> they're, they're distinct. But they're distinct for a reason. Because God wants manhood to express diversity because there's diversity in the Godhead. There's diversity in the God. And this is, this is significant. And we know this more than any other generation that has lived on the face of this earth. That understanding that there is a distinction between maleness and femaleness is important because we are being tempted. I said we are being tempted to remove the distinctions that exists between men and women. We're being tempted to erase maleness and femaleness. And part of the reason for this, or the argument for this, is that maleness and femaleness are just social constructs. They are just created by men or people throughout the ages in order for society to exist. There's no real purpose in them. They carry no real meaning. We can take them or leave them because they were created by man. But the Bible says that God didn't just create people. He created maleness and he created femaleness and he did it not from a whim. He did it with a purpose so it can reflect the distinction that exists within the Godhead. So we got to be careful not to tamper with this truth. Because write this down. When you change the truth concerning your identity, you change the truth concerning God's identity. When you change the truth Concerning your identity, you necessarily change the truth about God's identity because the two identities are inseparable. Your identity as a male or a female has purpose is intentional, is intended to reflect who God is. And when you tamper who you are, then you tamper, change, and alter the truth, what you are communicating to others who God is. Romans chapter 1, I'm going to show you. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I know. I know what month this is. You don't have to remind me. Relax. I know it. 
I know what month this is. And see, I ain't mad. See, because a lot of this, a lot of this, you know, I'm serious. A lot of this, some people, not everyone, but some people don't mean no harm. I said, I said some people. They don't mean no harm. They just don't know. I said, you just don't know. How I many know when you're a first-time homeowner, you start saying, oh, I don't need that. Yeah, okay, you're going to find out in a minute. You. Anybody ever been a first-time homeowner and you, and, and, and you didn't know all the stuff to be checking every month? And, because you lived in an apartment and the, and the landlord did all the checking. But after that thing bust on you a couple of times, you said, oh, okay, I see now. You start learning some things. You got to be educated. I'm trying to educate you. Before you start digging in there and ripping stuff out, I don't need this. You ever did that? You ever cleaned out a closet, an attic, or something? I don't need this. I don't. And then you're like, I needed that. <laughs> How about your computer? Have you ever did that? You, I've done it to my computer. You know, your computer's running slow. And you're like, I know what's wrong. I need to get rid of some of this garbage. You just start throwing stuff away. Just delete. I'm going to delete this whole file, you know. This whole folder. Get out of here. Now your computer won't even turn on. It just won't. This won't work. I mean, you, know, you got rid of something you shouldn't have. Say, say, I went too far. So we can change God's identity intentionally or unintentionally. I didn't say you did it on purpose. I'm saying when you change your identity, mm, you're messing with the truth. Okay, Romans chapter 1, verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made like unto corruptible man or birds or four-footed beasts or creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies between themselves who changed, who changed the truth of God into a lie, worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their woman did change the natural use into that which is against nature. So again, you're just changing things. And basically it says, when you change this, I didn't say you change God, you change the truth about God. Because you are the truth. You're, you're a walking testimony. Just like he created the stars to be a testimony or to testify of his truth, he created man to be a testimony of his truth. Even before there were Bibles, even if there were no Bibles, God's truth will always be in the earth because he wrote it in the stars and he wrote it in the people. He wrote everything about him. You can see an exact picture of who God is if you just look close enough. Uh, but we've been erasing the Mona Lisa. Oh my. Oh my. We've been putting mustaches on Rembrandt. Like little children changing the Mona Lisa to a man putting a mustache on it. Oh, you don't want to do that. This is the Mona Lisa. You don't want to do that. You want to be careful. Yes, yes, yes. Amen, somebody. Amen. So since man was made in the image of God, when we alter the, alter the truth concerning ourselves, as I said, we intentionally or unintentionally alter the truth concerning God. And if the truth we have concerning ourselves is fluid or non-binary, you may have heard that word before. Some of you say, like, what is a non-binary? The word binary means able to be put into two categories. 
So there's an idea that, you know, you can't put people in categories, maleness and femaleness. We don't fall in one or two categories. We, we might fall into many categories. Well, when you say man can fall into one category or many categories, what are you saying about God? He can fall into many categories. He's not the father and the son. He's the earth, wind, stars, fire. You know, they had a singing group, earth, wind, and fire. Because that's who they thought God was, earth, wind, and fire. Yeah, that's what it's about, in case you didn't know. It's idolatry. God is the sky, the fire, the wind, the this, the this. Uh, that's because we have this idea that man is fluid. We, if we can be anything, God can be anything. If I can change my identity, then who can stop me from changing God's identity? We must understand that being male, being female relates to our understanding of God. You find me someone who is willing to change their identity, I will show you someone who has already changed what they think about God. You cannot change your identity and think the same thing you've always thought about God. This is not just about your expression. It's about his expression because his expression is tied into your expression. I said it's not just about you expressing yourself because your expression is tied in to his expression. So just know when you go in to that clinic and you change your identity, then you're going to have to abandon everything you believed. You got to. Can't, it don't go together. Oh, no, I still believe. No, you don't. The Bible says you don't. The Bible says the moment you change the truth about yourself, you've already changed the truth about God because God had made you that way. Come on, somebody. I know, I know you don't want to say nothing in case you put on Facebook. But I'm the one talking. They can't see your face. Jesus name. And that's not the point. I want you to see something. This is not a witch hunt. This is an education. I said this is not a witch hunt. It's an education. It's an education. Now if you're willing to abandon your faith, then fine. It's fine. It, it, if God means nothing to you, then fine. But I'm talking to those who God means something to. And you want to hold on to your relationship with God. Well, hold on to your identity. Our maleness, our femaleness relates to our understanding of God. More specifically, the way we express our maleness, hmm. the way we express our femaleness reflects what we know about God. People who struggle expressing their maleness or their femaleness are individuals who are struggling to understand God. You don't. So we're going to try to help you see who God is so you can better know who you are. The better you are able to understand God and who he is, specifically not just the father, but the dynamic in the relationship between the father and the son. When you can clearly understand that dynamic, you can better understand yourself because you are a reflection of that in either your maleness or your femaleness. The more, the more I know about God, the more I know what it means to be male. The more I know what it means to be female. I will know what makes men different from women. 
and I will know what makes us the same. When you can understand the dynamics in the Godhead, you can understand what makes us different and what makes us the same. John chapter eight. Oh, my goodness. I've had all these things jumbled in my mind. I was telling my wife yesterday, had all these things jumbled in my mind. I was just praying like I could get them out, you know. This is so important that we see this. John chapter 8, verse 42, John 8, 42, Jesus said unto them, Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I, watch this, proceedeth forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Oh, man, he just dropped a load, right? A boatload of wisdom. What in the world? He says, you can't understand me because you don't understand the father. And you don't understand that I didn't come of myself, but I proceeded. I proceeded from the father. The word proceeded there, it means to go out of. It means to be taken out from another. The word proceeded means to go out or to be taken out from another. Jesus didn't just exist independently of God. He came out of the Father. He didn't say, I came out from Mary. He's not talking about his carnation, his incarnation. He's talking about his very essence. I came out from God even before I came into the world. And he was taken out from him. Now, we said that Jesus, uh, the father and the son, is a reflection or related in some way to the man and the woman. Guess what? That's exactly what happened to the woman. The woman wasn't created independently of Adam from the dust. God could have made the man from the dust, which he did, and then went over here and got some more dust and made the woman, which he did not do. He didn't do it because he couldn't do it. He said, man, I don't know if I can do that again. Whoa. No, he didn't do it. He could have made another one from the dust just like he made the first one but he said that wouldn't fit so you know what he did he reached inside of man and took one of his 12 ribs why the rib because it's the only bone in the human body that can regenerate itself if you properly dislodge it from its casing then that rib will grow back. Doctors do it all the time when they do surgery on your internal organs. They'll just remove it because it will grow back. He took that rib out of man and he made the woman so that the woman wouldn't be independent of the man but would be bone of his bone. Flesh of his flesh. She was already going to be different because the plans God had in his mind, but they had to have sameness. He wanted there to be unity in the diversity. Not just diversity, but unity in the diversity. And the only way for him to do that is to pull the woman out from the man. The woman does not exist separately from the man. She came out of the man. The man, therefore, is the first father of the woman. Now who's your daddy? Yeah. I said, who's your daddy? By doing that, you know what God said? Because if we look at the model, the model is this. The father and the son, the man and the woman. 
So according to the motto, the man is like the father. And the woman is like the son. Because both the son and the woman were taken out from another. So to understand what it means to be man or male or manhood, you got to understand something about fatherhood. This is why a day like today, it's not just for natural fathers. It's for men in general, because every man to be a real man, you have to in some way know what it means to be a father, because being a male is a reflection of fatherhood. And I don't mean the fatherhood you see in movies. I don't mean fatherhood you see on the street corner. I don't mean fatherhood you even see in your daddy or your uncle. I mean fatherhood as expressed by God himself. Because man wasn't made in the image of man, he was made in the image. Man wasn't made to reflect his natural father, he was made to reflect his heavenly father. So it doesn't matter if you've ever had a male in your life. I don't know how to be a man. I ain't never had a man. Because you, you don't look at the men around you to be a man. You look at the. I, I'm not getting no amens here. I'm, getting, I get, I'm telling you, he nailed all the excuse, excuses to the cross. You don't need another man to teach you how to be a man. You need to be looking to God. Because whatever man you see, you need to be a better man than that. And any man worth his salt is always telling his sons, be a better man than me. Well, how can they be a better man than you if you are their example? I'm not your example. He's your example. You're only following me as far as I follow. Don't follow any man if he's not following. Because I already said if a man isn't of God in his image, he ain't a real man no way. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Mm-mm. Every man should be like the father. I said every man should be like the father. I didn't say every man should be a father. See, that's what we think. We think I'm not a man until I get married and have kids. No, no, no. The, the, I'm not telling you that to be a man, you got to be somebody's father. I said, to be a man, you got to be like the father. There are qualities of the heavenly father that you need to adopt as you try to express your manhood. And we're going to talk about those as we close this thing out. What does it mean to be a man? It means to be a father or like the father. And being like the father means four things. Number one, being like the father means giving. Being like the father means giving. Being like the father means giving. If you want to be a real man, you got to be a giver. A stingy man is not a real man. Matthew chapter five. Mm -mm. I don't see these men. Come on, these men. What you want this for? Uh, how much is it? Again, you're coming to me. You ain't no real man. You're your real man. I said, you ain't no real man. Now, you may be complaining to give to her, but you're going to have to give to somebody. You can't express your manhood without giving. How do life come to be? Some men have to give something in order for there to be life. It's all about giving. Your whole life is about giving. I hate to inform you. If you hate to give, you might as well quit. Your whole life is going to be about giving. Okay. That's what it means to be a father. I want to be a daddy. Well, that means giving. And fatherhood and manhood, they go together. Mark, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, Matthew 5, 44. But I say unto you, but I say unto you, Love your enemies, 
Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your father, which is in heaven. For he, notice, maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, sendeth rain on the just. Now, is the father God only given to his children? He's given to all. So you don't have to be a daddy to be a father. They don't have to be your kids. This don't have to be your family. I give because that's what men do. That's why whenever they need something, they look at the men. What y'all going? Yes, that's good. We're going to get it together, but y'all going to give us some money, you know. At least that's what my, my family do when we go out. They look to all of them. What y'all going to do about this bill, you know? So if you go to a restaurant and he's not going in his pocket, you should be like, hmm, what am I marrying? <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 12, turn over there. I know, I know, I know. Hey, I'm just telling you, man, that's how I work. That's how it works. You're going to give. You're going to give till it hurts. It hurt. it's, it's hurting. It's hurting. I know on today, everybody's giving to you, kids giving to you, mama giving to you, sister giving to you. But I mean, no, this is an exception because we're usually the one giving, writing checks. Even today, I'm writing checks. Right? <laughs> this is my day. It don't matter, Reverend. You still give it. Cough it up, you know. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 14. Behold, the third time I'm ready to come to you and will not be burdensome unto you. For I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Paul, the apostle Paul is writing here to the church of Corinth. And he saw himself as their spiritual father. He, in fact, he says that in 1 Corinthians 4, he says, you have not many fathers. You have many teachers, but have not many fathers. I am your spiritual father. And he says, as a father, fathers do not seek the wealth of their children. They seek the health, giving, supporting their children. F fathers don't ask, what y'all done, done laid up for me? Fathers lay up for children. You know, we appreciate the socks, but we don't need the socks. We appreciate the tie. We don't need the tie. I don't really care. I don't care. Like I told you, you know, what can we give you? Peace? <laughs> you know? <laughs> a, a real man is not really looking for you to give him anything. It's not looking for you to give him, where's my stuff? This is, I, don't get, I didn't get nothing. No, man, you sound like a girl. <laughs> you sound like a girl. Stop whining. What do you care? I don't, look, I don't care if nothing is down there. I don't care. If I want it, I'll go buy it. I don't care. And these men are just all like, I ain't got nothing. Y'all didn't give me, y'all gave your mama, they didn't give me nothing. <laughs> well, welcome to manhood in Jesus' name. Any men out there can, to bear witness, welcome. They get a mama. Yeah, I heard, I heard, someone, I heard someone say the other day, like when, when, when mom, when on mama's day, they, they go to Zales. What is it, Zales? K, K jeweler, but on father's day, where they go? Foreman Mills. <laughs> Anybody know what Foreman Mills is? It's, yeah, it's like, Home Depot for clothes, you know. <laughs> it's Home Depot's Macy's. <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, poor Mahan Mill. I mean, where's, where's my heart-to-heart -heart necklace, you know? No, no, you, you get no Pandora in Jesus' name. Being like the Father not only means giving, being like a Father means working. To be like the Father means working, working. John chapter 15, fathers work. 
oh my God, these lazy men ain't working. You ain't no man. I'm sorry to tell you. I didn't say men have a job. Men work even when you don't have a job. So it's like, I, I can't find no job. It doesn't matter about you finding a job. It's about you should have been out there working, cleaning the yard, doing something like painting the fence. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't do anything. I, this is a bunch of excuses. Carrying a sign. Grown, hairy, strong men carrying signs. Do You got a quarter. Get a job. At least wash my windows. I'll give you a quarter. Just wash my window. Yeah, man, do something. Okay, I'm about to show you what the father does. I know you think the father just sitting up there with his feet crossed. No, he never had his feet crossed. John 15, John 15, verse 1. Then came, John, I'm sorry, John 15. I don't know why I'm in Matthew. John 15. Oh, praise God. It says, I am the true vine. My father is the what? Is the what? You know what a husbandman is? It's a compound word. The word husbandman here is a compound word, and it means literally one who works the ground. The word husbandman is translated from a Greek word that means work, ergo, work, and it means one who works or tills the ground. The father is a worker of the ground. He's working the ground. He's working the ground. Jesus is divine, but the Father, who's doing it? The Father's working. The Father's working. We talk about Jesus, but this is the Father that's working. He's working. He's the one who's working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Every father is a worker. Every father is a worker. John chapter 5. Fathers are husbands. Husbands are workers. Oh, my God. I think I might put that in my uh, premarital counseling. Husbands are workers. The very word mean worker. You got these husbands that won't work. Mm, don't go down the aisle, sweetheart. Don't even go. Don't even go down the aisle. Just, just, go, just go back. Don't go down the aisle. Find out if he's working first. That's the first, that's the first question I asked him when I said, I, I, I heard her. I said, do, where do you work? You know. Oh, I'm in between. Oh, I'm all, you already strike one. You strike one. Strike one. Streak. Streak. Like, you only got two left now, mister. Come on, step back up to this plate. <laughs> John 5 and 17, John 5, 17. Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. Oh, you see this? Somebody say, I'm listening. I'm listening. The son says, I work because I see my father working. I know why these sons ain't working. The daddy ain't working. You got, we're wondering why the sons ain't working. We need to be asking, well, why the daddies ain't working? You see, these daddies will work hard. You know, that'll spill off into these boys. The best thing a father can do to help train his son is to work. Show them that you are not afraid to go to work. Work every day. Work all the time. Sun up, sun down. Rain, rain sleet, snow, whatever. Feeling great, not feeling great. Take some aspirin and get in that car. Let's go to work. We got lazy sons because we probably got some lazy fathers. Mm -mm. I'm just saying. Somebody say, I'm just saying. 
What does it mean to be a man? It means to be a father. And what's the father like? Being like the father means protecting. It means giving, it means working, and it means protecting. John chapter 10. Fatherhood, manhood is protecting. Right? Go see who at the door. Come on, man of God. Come on, man of God. Come on, man of God. Stop sending your wife downstairs to answer the door at 11. Well, who, go see who that is. Oh, man of God, get out to bed in Jesus' name. Wear the maleness. Be a male. Be a male in Jesus' name. Protect. I said protect. Mm. John 10. I, look, you clearly didn't learn that from the Father. I'm telling you, you're watching too many movies of men pimp women. Pimps ain't men. Pimps aren't fathers. They're scavengers. They use people. They don't give, they take. They're not selfish, selfless, they're selfish. And they're not protectors. You should be protecting this woman. You throwing her out there. To every gentleman that walks down there, you need to be protecting these women. You're giving them baby after baby. Protect that woman's honor. You don't even care nothing for her. Protect that woman. And we got this bad in our community. We don't protect our women. It ain't manly. It's effeminate. And it's not godly. Because if it's not manly, it's certainly not godly. Because manliness is an expression of godliness. John 10 and 29. My father, here it is again, which gave them me is greater than all. And nobody is able to pluck them out of my father's. That's protection. He says, everyone who belongs to me belongs to my father. And trust me, ain't nobody getting past him. Because nobody can pluck you out of his hand. He will protect you. It means something when a man puts a woman's hand in his hand. I got you. I'm protecting you. I said it means something when a man puts his family in his hands. I'm protecting you. And there's no greater expression of godliness than that. Protection. It's time for the men to take on the qualities of their heavenly father. Be givers. Be workers. Be protectors. Genesis chapter 2. Yeah, this is, this is, this is, yeah, we're going, yeah, I told you, if you stick around here long enough, you'll be a good man. You'll be a good man. You stick around here long enough, we'll, we'll help you. We'll, we'll get you right. If you've got a young man, just bring him here. We, he just keep coming. He'll, he'll learn. He'll be a good man. He'll be a good man. We'll get him right. We'll get him right, but you got to have him. You got to have him here. He ain't around. He ain't hearing this. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 15, and the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to both dress it and to keep it. Whew, my God. The word dress there, again, is the word work. Till the ground, work the ground, be a husband, work it, work it. You know, God never gives you the whole thing. He'll give you a seed and you got to work that thing. I did, it, it wasn't all, I went there, but it wasn't all complete. Well, yeah, work it in Jesus' name. You got to work that thing. You got to work that thing. You know, you, you give a real man a car, it don't even have to work. They don't have to run well. He'll figure it out. Just that's all. I'm just I'm good. Thank you. I'll figure it out from here. He'll get, he'll get in there and get that thing working. 
He'll get that thing working. You, we got these little mamsy pamsies. It's got to be a 2022. Nothing wrong with it. Get act to your daughter. Give your son the hoopty. Give him the hoopty. The tire got flat. Well, I guess you got to have to change it. You know, that's what happens. You change the tire. Yeah. You hear that sound? Yeah, is it moving? Well, just keep moving. Just put some dollars aside. Don't buy all the running boards. Make them put a running board. You want a running board? Put it on there. You know, that's what you got a job for. Work that thing. And then he says, and keep it. That word keep means to guard and protect. See, God knew that there was going to be an enemy trying to come in there and just bring confusion. The reason why the woman fell is because the man didn't do his job. Wasn't protecting. Just letting your wife go out there all uncovered. You should have went to the meeting too. No, I'm going too to the meeting because ain't nobody touching you that I don't like. No, nah, you ain't touch. No, nah, no, nah. going somewhere. Going down there. Going down the aisle over there. She good. I said she good. You just letting her go and do all kind of stuff. And all kind of stuff is coming. Now you're trying to figure out what's happened to my wife. You done left her unprotected. You got to watch over that. I said, you got to watch over. And that means you got to know some word too. No, nah, that ain't the Bible. No, nah, that ain't the Bible. She know more than you. She the protector. How are you going to protect and you don't even know how to protect? You don't know how to use none of the weapons. The shield, the sword, nothing. Nothing. How are you going to protect your family against the forces of darkness when you can't wield the sword of the Spirit? When you don't know how to use a shield of faith, how? She's the one out there protecting the church. In the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, you know, she's out there. She's the priestess. This, this, this. It's madness. We got it in a home and we got it in the church. No men anywhere. Mm, that's, that's not godliness. Godliness is not just femaleness, it's also maleness. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. I got one more for you because I know you're tired of me. <laughs> Being like the Father means leading. Leading. It means giving, working, protecting, and leading. These are the qualities not only a fatherhood, of manhood, giving, working, protecting, leading, leading. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 6, leading, leading, not waiting. Got too many waiters. Got too many male waiters. We need some male <laughs> leaders. <laughs> Are these male waiters, where is the, the head of the house in Jesus' name? I'm about to show you. Ephesians chapter 6, yes, leading, leading. My father used to say, you can't lead from the back. Say, aha. Okay. Whatever leading is, you can't do it from the back. Oh, come on now. Yeah, I'm, uh, come on now. You, you, you got them ties and them socks. Now you're going to have to earn it. You can't lead from the back. You've got to lead from the front. It should be in your core to be uncomfortable in the back. You need to get out front. Yeah, I'm pulling on you. Get to the front. Stop going in the back of everything. You're always in the back, always in the back, always in the back, always last, always bringing up the rear. Get in front. Be the first one at the door so you can open it. I'm coming, 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 I'm coming. <laughs> and she's shaking her head the whole time. She, she's just, uh, you know. 
Why you? I see you shaking your head. Why you shaking your head? I'm shaking my head because I want a head. <laughs> Ephesians 6 <laughs> and verse 4. And you fathers, there it is again. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I'm going to read the same verse in the message. Fathers, fathers, don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. We think being a man is just yelling, everybody be quiet. Again, you watch so many movies. That's not what real fatherhood is, yelling at people. Fathers, don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. Take them by the hand and what? Lead them in the way. Don't drop them off at church. Lead them in the way. And you can't lead behind. You got to get in front of the children. Got to get in front. So leader, being a leader is being first. You should be the first to do everything in your house. First to pray, first to seek God, first to work, first to walk in the truth. First, 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 first. How do I be a man? Be first. Stop being second and third and fourth and fifth. Be first. Be the first one. I'll do it. First one. First one to volunteer. First one to get out there. First. First. That's a leader. First, no, you first. That's the leader. You first. You first. Amen. Fatherhood is equivalent to leadership. Leadership requires us to be first, and being first requires us to take initiative. 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 It's not about screaming and hollering and being pushy and obnoxious and a jerk. Being first is about taking initiative. Well, well, give it to me. Let me try it. Let me first. First Corinthians 16. I'm ending with this. First Corinthians 16. First Corinthians 16. Anybody getting anything out of this? Oh, shit. 1 Corinthians 16, and that's uh, verse 12. Yeah, this is it. As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have a convenient time. Verse 13, but watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men be strong. What's happening here? Paul is at the close of this letter. He's telling the Corinthians that he had asked Apollos if he can fill in for him while he was away so he can, you know, help minister to them spiritual things and help in their development. You know, because Apollos was also uh, one of the apostles. He was also uh, one of the leaders in the church. He says, man, I can't be in Corinth. Can you go down there? They really need some help. And Apollos was busy doing some other things. He says, I'll get there when I can. But he writes to the church at Corinth and he tells them, even if Apollos doesn't get there, I need somebody to be a man and take initiative. Take initiative for their own spiritual development. Don't wait on pastor. You do it. I didn't call the pastor. Ain't nobody answering. Duh. Be a man. You do it. Do you hear what I'm saying? Part of being a man isn't just waiting on somebody else to come and fill the gap and feel the need. It's you saying, okay, look, I could do this too. Amen. Pastor, show me what you just did. Okay, yeah. Or anoint my hands and I'm going to go back home and I'm going to do it. 
There now, 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 now. Now you're you're getting there. Because now you want to take the lead and don't always have to wait on someone else to supplement. See, that's what you can always find a man to man and say, OK, show me how to do that. I'm going to go get that myself. They'll go somewhere. They'll see something. They say, man, I'm going to buy that for myself. I'm about to get down. I'm about to do that myself. That's what men do because they want to take the lead. They want to provide. You got to take that initiative. And that's what I'm urging us men to begin to do. You may have needed others to come in, but after a while, you should have learned that. Amen. You, you need to learn those, those uh, how that takes place and then start taking the initiative and provide that for your own family, for your children, for your wife, for those around you. And I'm saying to you, young men, you don't have to have a baby to be a man. I said you don't have to have a child. You don't have to bring children into the world to be a man. What you do have to do is take your direction from the Heavenly Father and understand that manhood is about giving, working, protecting, and leading. It doesn't matter where you do it, just do it. Maybe you're going down to um, a, a community center and you're helping out there, totally fine. That's what men do. They they get in there and they're part of the of the solution. They're giving, they're working, they're protecting, they're leading. That's what we're called to do. And as we do that, we reflect the image of our God. Because he makes his son to rise on the just and the unjust. He makes his reign to fall on the just and the unjust. The heavenly father, he's giving, he's working, he's protecting, and he's leading everybody, all kinds of people, not just his own, because that's what he does. Now, what they do with that, a lot of that is on them, but God is doing it, and he's been doing it from the beginning. And he's called us men to be image bearers. I want every man to stand on your feet today. Hallelujah. These are image bearers right here. Every man stand on your feet. Again, not just fathers, every man, young or old, every male. You are an image bearer. You are an image bearer. God created you to be a reflection of his godliness. He made you to be a reflection of him. And I'm going to pray for you that whatever barriers is keeping that from happening, that you will begin to take on this responsibility, accept the challenge, and not be tempted to change or alter that assignment, but embrace it. Bow your heads with me today. Father, I pray for these image bearers, these men. You made them. They may or may not be reflecting your image, but they were certainly made to do so. And Father, while many of them may not be able at least immediately to be an exact replica of who you are. I do pray that you would make them a shadow at the very least. Lord, let them, let them bear the, the image of your godliness. Father, enable them and give them a heart to be givers workers, protectors, and leaders. Put that in them, Lord. Urge them to be that wherever they may be, in their home, in their community, in the church. 
wherever they may be, that they will be givers, workers, protectors, and leaders, that they will bear your image in the earth. And Father, I pray that as we do that, that we would see your glory. We will see transformation in the communities where we serve, in the homes where we serve, in the churches where we serve, that we will be the catalyst. These men will be the igniters of a whole new change in this generation. And I thank you for this word, and I thank you for these men, those who are accepting this challenge. And Father, I thank you for the grace you are depositing in them in order to accomplish this great work. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Thank you for listening. If this teaching has been a blessing to you and you'd like to partner with our ministry to share the message of Jesus Christ, please visit our website at www.hmclive.org and click the donate button. If you're in our area, we invite you to join us at 4317 Lippincott Boulevard, Burton, Michigan, 48519. Harris Memorial Church of God in Christ, teaching the truth and showing the love. Use me, Lord.